I have a question for uh, Alexey Petrov uh, about clinical trials in surgical oncology. And um, I'd like to uh, clarif clarify some information. If we have an uh, experienced team in our clinical center, oncological center, and we uh, want to take part in uh, clinical trials, which, what steps we should uh, perform to take part in these clinical trials and how can we find these clinical trials because uh, we have a specialist in gynecological malignancies in thoracic surgery and abdominal surgery so how how can we take part in these trials and the second question if we have ideas for clinical trials but we have no uh, enough funds for these trials uh, how uh, maybe you can uh, advise some steps how to realize these ideas Thank you. So uh, I won't be able to tell you about all the trials in gynae and other specialties just because I don't know. I'm just a surgeon in our department. Uh, regarding our trial, uh, we have some requirements for the center and for the surgeons who are taking part. So if your center is performing more than 50 colon resections for cancer a year, uh, the center is okay. And for surgeons, they have to have experience of at least 20D2 and 20D3, and prior to entering the trial, you'll have to send four non-edited videos for each surgeon who will be operating in the trial, D2 and D3 on, on the right and D2 and D3 on the left. Uh, it can be easily arranged, just send me an email and we'll change the context. We are very happy for other centers. As I have said, we have 12 now. We have two in St. Petersburg, in Moscow, in Rostov, in Krasnodar, in Fa, so our geography is very wide. We're now negotiating uh, a center in Slovenia. Uh, there are some obvious uh, difficulties, but from that perspective, you're very welcome and everyone is very welcome to take part in our trial. Uh, and regarding funding, well, I'm a very bad advisor here because we don't have any in our trial, so it's just on enthusiasm. Uh, it is a great problem, actually. I just didn't want, intentionally, I didn't touch this topic because it should be financed and it should be properly financed, but as you know, our reality, uh, there is no actual science from above. Everything comes from below, from us, from surgeons. So this is just the first project because there are certain people who want to do real science and they're happy to put their effort just for free. So no advice with funding and you're very welcome in our trial. Okay. Uh, I, have, I have another comment, and I have uh, appreciated so much your presentation, try to involve junior surgeons in the, uh, you know, uh, mass, in masterizing clinical trials. Uh, as I said before, most of trials in oncology involving surgeons are just involving surgeons in multidisciplinary protocols. And uh, this produces a lack of quality control. There is a, a, an extreme quality control on data, and sometimes these data are significant, but they produce fake results. A, a big example of uh, that, for example, is what we know uh, as uh, the McDonald trial. It was an important trial conducted 15 years ago in the United States, demonstrating that radiation therapy is an effective treatment for gastric cancer. But if you look at the data of the McDonald trial, uh, more than 50% of patients receive an insufficient D1 lymphadenectomy. So it means that uh, radiation was effective because surgery was just uh, leaving some remnant. And uh, without quality control, we are producing uh, evidence-based information that uh, after that become standard of care without any proof. And this is what happened with radiation therapy for some years. So uh, I, I would like you uh, to stress again a word that we need surgery only trials or surgery trials where surgeons are leaders and quality control is implemented by us. Don't you think it's, uh, it's an important point? Yeah, I completely agree and that is uh, maybe one of the main problems with the surgical trials because with the drug trials, well it is easier to administer the, tri the drug and it is so much easier to check because as you know they always there is a certain amount of patients who get pharmacokinetics analysis and they will check if you have really given the drug and when. So uh, it is a problem to standardize surgery. So as I said, in our trial, there are very strict entry requirements for surgeons. So every surgeon who is now enrolled to operate in cold trial has sent four video recordings of their procedure and they were uh, independently assessed. We had several surgeons that were declined to participate because they could not produce the distinct surgery. In the protocol, we have a very thorough description of what is called D2, what is called D3, what anatomical landmarks are required to be seen in both, 
and in, any, in every case, in every procedure, a picture of vessel with a clip or several vessels, if it's right side, for example, are attached to electronic CRF and the picture of the specimen from both sides is attached. So uh, that is actually, that is the maximum that we can think of regarding quality control from the surgical point of view. But that really makes things so much easier because as you said, surgeon can write that he did D3, but when he has to attach a picture, it gives us a very good incentive to be more strict to ourselves to what we've done in the operating room. So by now, during monitoring data, we always uh, assess these pictures, and if there are no anatomical landmarks that are mentioned in the protocol, then this dissection can be um, named differently. And I think it's about more about self-control. When the surgeon knows that the picture will be uploaded, if he failed to do D3, he will honestly say, well, I failed to do D3, I did D2, that's absolutely normal. There is a certain amount of patients where it's too dangerous to do D3, but anyway, yeah, control of surgical procedure is, is crucial. If you have no control, I agree, your data will be very ambiguous because we're all different when we operate differently. So from our perspective, we gave very thorough description of CME and of standard thing, and we gave very thorough description of what is changing, D2 versus D3. So, and again, you will face it if you, if you will be enrolling patients in the trial, your surgeons will go very strict assessment. Any other questions regarding trials? Cold trial in particular. We have just 200 patients to be enrolled, so if you hurry up, you can you can still take part, and hopefully we'll we'll have some benefits like papers, presentations, and everything. We can't offer you money, unfortunately, but we can offer you fame. Thank you. Any other questions from the other presenters, please? I have noticed. I've noticed that. Uh, I've noticed that it is not only the lack of homogeneity in education that came up from this uh, short debate, but I have heard at least a couple of uh, presenters complaining about the quality of their training. Uh, I mean, Dr. Uh, Pugayev said something like that, and you too said something like that. Um, well, don't you think? And this is a, a task that is given to young people that it is not complaining inside this room, but uh, giving to the general public the awareness that surgeons want to improve their training, but they find extreme difficulties in this world. And don't you think that we have to uh, send this message not only to the general public, but also to the lawmakers, because rules and regulations are needed in order to establish that every single surgeon is trained the same way, and there is no discrepancies, like he said, also in the same country. You see two different paths, two different surgeons doing different uh, uh, paths. I mean, don't you think that uh, networking among juniors can be the best way to raise awareness or, on this inequality issue? I don't know if Dr. Pugayov has to say something about this or to comment his presentation. If you talk about uh, uh, talking. Yes, you talk. I mean, I was struck about the fact that you were complaining. You were set because you said I was not expecting uh, all, that, all that amount of paperwork and at yeah. the end of the game, the track, the path is different and nobody recognizes what I really am at the end of this period. And sometimes I have reached my goal with zero operation done. Yes, uh, the main, uh, the general main of my report, it's uh, in Russia, we haven't a standard of surgical education. Um, if you go to the uh, general surgery or oncology surgery, uh, we haven't a, a, stand, a standard cases uh, when you uh, did in this period uh, of your education. It's uh, a really big problem because uh, you, may, uh, uh, you may have many assistants, you may have uh, many... Um, uh, mini surgery operation, if you think about una uh, anastomosis gastroenter, uh, uh, anastomosis, uh, a type of uh, many steps of mobilization, but you don't need uh, operation of them. It's, uh, I think it's, by the way. 
Yeah, but also we have examples like Aisha, that is from Isaac, and she's been uh, traveling a lot, she's visiting France and other countries. Uh, can, can you tell about your experience? But, I mean, in terms of correcting this idea that surgery is just a dreadful work and nobody cares about you. I mean, if you are the pilot of the car, you can identify a pad that enlarges your horizons. And I, I don't know if you would like to briefly explain your experience. Sure, I would like to thank you for the question. So it's really a huge problem to my mind in our country. Uh, to be honest, uh, you know, um, to my mind, it's really so that all of your uh, education in the surgical residency in our country, it's uh, only self-made. Uh, and, you know, here is the really important question of the mentorship. Because, uh, as Andrea said, it's, uh, mm, it's a real... Um, you will be really lucky if you will find the mentorship who will guide you to the uh, different possibilities, who will guide you with some recommendations, uh, what to do, how to do, and where to do. And maybe the person who will honestly will say you like, uh, here you should stop, or maybe here you should see on the other way. So, uh, uh, because you know, the, all the education now, it's uh, and our teachers, they are like volunteers. You know, they are not um, good paid for, only for this job. You know, they are doing uh, their job, they are doing their surgeries as a surgeon, but they are not paid by uh, as a teacher. So, you know, it's not so simple, and that's why uh, all this training is really self-made. So, uh, each of the surgeons now in our country has to find some possibilities to improve their manual skills, you know, uh, to uh, find some uh, new knowledge and stuff like that. So you have to be really strong, you have to be really ambitious and I guess, uh, you know, it's like, a, I don't know how to say, it, it's like a real Sparta now in our country to my mind. So uh, here a life will say only, you know, the strongest, uh, the best, mm, but mm, uh, it's hard to say, maybe not the best, but you know, they're really the strongest persons who will be able to go through all of these difficulties. So but I have one question, because um, comparing the situation to Germany, um, where I worked for nearly 12 years, um, the speciality degree in Germany is uh, strongly associated to a certain number of procedures. Mm -hmm. So the, your boss has to sign that you performed 400 abdominal procedures, including, I don't know, gastric resection, colorectal resection. How is it in Russia? It's a huge luck, so we don't have logbooks and we don't, we don't have this, you know, list of the procedures that we have to do, so to make by ourselves. So that's why, you know, it's like, to be really honest, some of the surgeons uh, can pass through the residency and they will not do any operations by themselves. May I add something? Um... Most of you, for sure, will know that there is a whole bunch of new literature about the new ways of teaching surgery. Uh, and we desperately need not only to teach more surgeons because there is a shortage of surgeons worldwide and qualified surgeons for cancer is another shortage, but we are facing something really new in surgical education. It's not only about simulators and training and boxes and cadavers, but there is a couple of things that are coming out uh, in terms of technology, in terms of new uh, uh, modalities of training that should be known. The first one is very crazy, but it's 5G. 5G will make any single operation shareable everywhere in the world. And I personally have been uh, learning surgery, keeping you know, retractors and using my head this way, trying to identify what my boss was doing inside the body. Now my re residents look at the five in 50 inches screen and they say, and they see the tip of my instruments doing the same. So they are learning much faster by mind. And another thing that is done now is that uh, differently from any other medical specialty, surgery can be measured. You can uh, count how many minutes does it take for you to make a knot and you can uh, do it two times, three times and when it's two minutes you can be 
uh, you know, permitted to go on. And if you divide every single operation step by step, you can be accredited to do the first step, the second step, the third step, and in your CV, when you perform one operation, is one operation at the end of the, the path, that is not to be two years or three years, but it's just needed that you have ended you know, step by step, a certain number of operations. So it's not, no, not only a matter of time, but a matter of things that have been done and reached. So you can demonstrate take out your skills, and now it is done by several apps. There are apps to register your skill, so you are called in the OR in some countries when you are ready to do the first step. So something is changing, and incredibly, I think, technology is helping us in this, and we will experience a brilliant new future looking at this kind of things. So, uh, I mean, you are right to complain, but please, we need juniors that are enthusiastic and push towards a better knowledge of surgery. Thank you. So, any other questions? Um, when? Uh, I would like to say some words, maybe after the professor, so maybe you will say something for the end. I, I think that my last words were, were <laughs> okay. enough for a conclusion and that you have heard my voice so much this, uh, this afternoon. Uh, the only thing I want to say is really uh, from my heart, thanks for being in this wonderful town, this wonderful Congress. It was a honor to be here. I hope that our uh, organization of, the, of this session will be enough to attract new surgical oncologists and new juniors in Isaac. Uh, we are looking forward to meet you in our uh, uh, in our hometown that is Brussels, but in our congresses and in our courses, look through the website and, 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 uh, and, and you will find a number of inspiration. Thank you again for being here with us. Andreas. Well, thank you very much. I can just say thanks a lot for including me here in this session. I, I think you, you heard for the young surgeons, which tools we can can have to to improve our our training. Nevertheless, I I would also like to to mention that at least in Germany, um, it's a bit also about the mindset to train young surgeons and the cost of the hospital is is a key factor. I I don't want to say that, but it's the truth. Uh, we, in in some departments, you have complaints about how many minutes was that procedure and is it cost effective and is it really cost effective when I train surgeons or not and uh, I think this is also one aspect we we have a beautiful um, um, example in the UK where the training is implemented uh, or excluded from the hospital costs because we need to train surgeons um, my, my former mentor always said I have to train you because who will operate me when I need a surgical oncologist <laughs> And, yeah, we will hopefully get there. Thank you. Nikita, like a host, we would like to hear you. Thank you. Uh, it's a great honor uh, to be here with ESO. It's such a great company. So I hope to um, see you next year here in St. Petersburg. Thank you. Uh, just to conclude, I will say a few words. Uh, my really big thanks for the audience, for all the participants, and for all the online viewers and, uh, who are looking for us now. Uh, just, uh, I would like to say that I hope that, uh, because like you are the reason why we decided to create this session, and I hope that this session is one of the important steps to promote uh, in our country the subspecialties of surgical oncology, and maybe to present the as a social as a perfect tool to, for your career development. So thank you all and uh, of course my big gratitude for the invited uh, speakers. Thank you for coming, thank you for your presentation, it was perfect. Thanks a lot.